So today we're gonna to talk about the art of the Pacific or oceanic art, if you will. When you're thinking about Oceania, it's really comprised of four different regions. Australia is so big that it kind of makes up its own region. In fact, some art historians will go as far as calling it Australasia, kind of silly, right? There's also Micronesia, the area between the Pacific Ocean um, from Japan to Hawaii, Melanesia, which stretches from Papua New Guinea, which is just outside of Australia, all the way to the island of Fiji, and Polynesia, which is located on the eastern portion of the Pacific Ocean and stretches as far as New Zealand to the Easter Island. And Easter Islands are off the coast of Chile in South America. So it's a vast, vast region. When we, get, when we think about art of um, Oceania, um, there are specific gender roles. In fact, gender roles were kind of um, applicable to different mediums, if you will. Um, men were expected to create the work out of wood and stone and bone. And most of the work that they created were used for ritualistic purposes. When you think about art of Oceania and the art of Africa, this art is not meant for aesthetic purposes only, but this art is meant to be used. It's utilitarian, whether it's through ritualistic purposes, religious purposes, or utilitarian in and of itself. When you think about women, women tended to use softer materials. They were creating cloths, bark cloth, things that were used for blankets, things that were used for bags and basketry. Um, so gender roles were clearly defined Something also to note during this about oceanic art and about African art, and that is there's a huge rift of, in cultural rituals, right? Oceanic cultures were radically disrupted um, by Western world contact, which came in the form of missionaries. Not only did we have explorers like Captain Cook coming to this area and Monteverde, but then after they discover these islands, they're sending great massive amounts of missionaries to, the, to settle in these islands. And with missionaries, they're bringing new Western religion, um, which actually completely condemns the indigenous religion and cultures of these people. So a lot of the art that you're going to see today um, is very unique and special because it's the only remaining examples of art of Oceania. Also thinking about uh, settlers that are coming from Europe, they're not only bringing their thoughts and belief structures, but they're also bringing diseases. So a lot of um, a lot of these islanders may have never been introduced to influenza virus, or may have never been introduced to um, uh, the common cold, right? And they didn't have the kind of immunities necessary to fight these kinds of illnesses. So a lot of these um, populations were decimated because of illness. Um, most of the materials that you're going to see in these works of art were indigenous to the region, shells, fibers, um, that sort of thing. Um, all right, so let's take a look at our first image. This is Nan Madal, and Nan Madal is really quite interesting. It was believed to be the center of the Sadalir dynasty. And look at it, right? It's this whole series, the city that's built on top of um, a, a coral reef. In fact, it's over 200 acres. And we know really, really very little about Nan Madal. We know that there are a hundred different little islands or islets that were constructed on a coral reef. It took over 800,000 tons of building material um, to build Nan Madal. Um, and the largest stone that's sitting on these coral reefs weighs more than 50 tons. Okay, so here's the kicker. These basalt boulders that are sitting on top of these coral reefs did not come from the neighboring island, right? But they came from a different island. You see how it's close right off the coast of that island? It came from an island far away. And it's really considered an impossibility by art historians. In fact, they've tried to recreate um, moving or transporting a 50 ton stone on wooden rafts. And of course, uh, 50 ton stone, the raft immediately sank. So it's really mysterious how in the world this whole um, construction took place. 
believe it or not, when you look at this, this is called the Venice of the Pacific. And it's clear to see why when you look at this aerial perspective, seeing these different canals that run among these um, islets, if you will. Something interesting about Nan Madal, and that is there was a great hierarchy of power or social stratus, um, right? Uh, not only was this a ritualistic center for the Sadalir dynasty, um, so you've got all the chiefs living there, but they thought that it would be much more conducive to controlling the, the populace or even people that might want to uprise against them by forcing them or making them live on these small little islands. The dwellings uh, have proved that there's a stratified social so social class in this society, um, and the dwellings of the chiefs um, found uh, important artifacts like shells and beads, things that might have been used in trade um, amongst the people themselves or amongst uh, neighboring islanders. All right, so we're moving to one of my favorite places, Rapa Nui, also known as the Easter Island. It sits off the coast of Chile, and there are these massive, massive heads that have nothing to do with gum gum or dum dum. If you've ever seen Night at the Museum, these guys kind of became famous because of their silliness. If you look at the middle image, these um, at these moi, these heads don't only just sit on the land, but look how deep they're buried beneath the earth. It's really incredible. Um, there are over 887 moi. They are only 14 of them were made of basalt, which is a very, very heavy stone. Um, and the other were all made out of tufa. And tufa is really, really soft volcanic stone. We've seen tufa before in Rome when they're carving in the catacombs and places like that. Very easy to carve, but basalt, not so much. Um, this is just kind of giving you a geographical reference, which I think is interesting. It sits so close to South America and so far away from Australia, but still um, part of Oceania. Um, in 1860, uh, Christian missionaries come to this area. And of course, um, the, the missionaries were completely put off by these giant idols, if you will. So most of, most of the... Um, Moy were actually toppled by the missionaries in the 1860s. There were not indigenous people in the Easter Islands. In fact, the people actually migrated here from Marquesas, which is crazy. It was over 2,200 miles away. Can you imagine getting on a little boat and floating over to the Easter Island to settle it? That's pretty incredible. I wanted to show you the picture on the top right because during this time when the settlers came, there was massive deforestation. Um, and we only think of this as a problem in contemporary, um, uh, in contemporary global affairs, but it was really a problem then as well. In fact, these trees were never replanted. The, the topography of Easter Island or Rapa Nui is very desolate. In fact, um, most biologists, um, uh, and uh, environmentalists um, point to Rapa Nui as being um, solely responsible for the extinction of over 22 species of, um, of lumber, of trees. Interesting to note that these uh, Moy statues are actually placed with their backs facing the sea and they were facing inward. Um, a lot of the uh, indigenous beliefs. Remember, this is a beautiful tropical island. So when you think about the people, you're thinking about Polynesian people, um, and um, they have very indigenous beliefs as well. They believe that cremated remains were actually kind of poured upon these statues, and often even um, mixed within the mortar when they were placed in the earth or placed on these pedestals as well. Um, so they held deep meaning for the indigenous people. I thought this was this a cool picture with the ocean in the background, protecting the island, um, putting their backs to anybody that might want to approach them. All right, so we're moving to Hawaii. Um, I think we often forget that um, Hawaii had indigenous people long before it was settled by a mainland United States. In fact, it was our last state, one of the last states to be settled. And it wasn't until, um, you know, 
the middle of the 1900s that this becomes a state and the indigenous culture is kind of done away with. Um, when you look at this, this entire cape is made up of feathers. Um, and the way they made this, there was a fiber net that would be cut um, in the shape that they would like for it to be laid upon the human person, right? It's a garment. Um, and then they would take small bundles of feathers, red feathers, um, and red really kind of denoted the power of gods and chiefs. And ye yellow feathers were so scarce that um, they were very, very precious. Um, they didn't kill the birds when they were making this these kinds of feather capes, but they were only allowed to pluck four feathers from each bird to make this cape. So talk about labor intensive. There are hundreds, if not thousands of feathers on this cape and only four feathers from one bird. So it took a very, very long time to collect these feathers. They're very, very precious. This was made for ceremonial purposes and uh, to go into battle. Um, and most, uh, most certainly um, would note male nobility uh, among the chief. This doesn't look like much at first glance. When you look at it, it just kind of looks like a stick that's wrapped up with maybe some fabric and, and um, raffia or grass twine. Um, and that's pretty much exactly what it is. There's a wooden staff on the interior when you look at it. It comes from an island of Rorotonga, which is one of the Cook Islands. Um, and in 1773, Captain Cook first sighted the islands. He spends very little time here, although he kind of lays claim to the Cook Islands and of course puts his stamp with his name on these islands. Um, and so um, when he comes there, he has little interaction with the people, but these are the deities that these people are worshiping. It's called a staff god because they're very skilled in um, at wood carving. And we look at the interior of this wrapped, um, wrapped staff. Uh, it's literally wrapped up or protected. The staff itself is carved um, and it has a face on one end. It had a phallus or a male sexual organ on the other end. Um, that And in between the face and the phallus were all these little images carved um, in and of themselves. All right, here's the image of the face and you can kind of see all the little deities that are carved underneath it. Well, just like almost all indigenous artwork of Oceania. Um, this was highly affected and greatly changed by the um, insertion of missionaries onto Rorotonga or the Cook Islands. In 1821, the London Missionary Society decides to set up shop on the Cook Islands. Um, in fact, it becomes a British territory in 1888 um, and it was annexed uh, in 1901. Um, this was representation of the deities prior to the island's conversion to Christianity. In fact, there are so few of these in existence. This is the only one left that it's in its original um, grass cloth fiber, uh, which is crazy. Um, of course, the, the missionaries, when they settled this area, when they saw these staff gods, they were kind of put off because they thought they were so obscene to include a male sex organ on one end that they um, allowed them to keep some of these staff gods, but they immediately, promptly removed the phallus from one end. Um, just like this one remaining example, the only surviving example, um, it is completely intact with the exception of the phallus that had been removed. It was a sacred, sacred object to these people. Um, and then of course, missionaries and settlers, colonization changed it all. All right, so we're moving on to look at this female deity and it is um, one of uh, very few that are surviving. It's a wooden figure that was um, meticulously carved. When you look at it, it's very stylized. Stylized mean that it's very sleek it has very little detail. It almost looks like modern art, something that you could see in a very modern house or interior. Um, this was carved and found on the atoll of the Caroline Islands. An atoll is kind of um, a coral reef in a that's a kind of in a circular fashion. Um, and this is a picture of it on the bottom right. It's so stunningly beautiful. The Caroline Islands actually include um, an island that you've probably heard of before called Bora Bora. Um, as part of Micronesia, and it's kind of a scuba diver's paradise. Um, they relied on oral tradition, 
we're going to see this much like indigenous Americans, um, uh, indigenous oceanic cultures relied on um, oral traditions. They were not writing things down like the Egyptians or um, other cultures, Mesopotamians that are coming before them. Um, the, this whole um, this whole culture was um, based on deities and it was prior to uh, the settlers that are bringing um, ideas of missionary and Christianity um, here. Polynesians come and they actually settle in Micronesia and they're the ones that bring this idea of hierarchy of rank. They also bring the artistic aesthetics of carving um, to the Caroline Islands and so uh, this is kind of where these artistic skills and aesthetic skills were picked up. Remember, most of these objects use it for ritualistic purposes. This was really just made as a deity figure to look upon, which is really unusual. Um, Micronesia was really, really big on navigation and weaving and canoe building prior to the settling of um, this area by the Polynesians. Um, it was uh, settled by European settlers, Juan Batista Monteverde, in 1806. At that time, there were only 400 inhabitants in this area, um, and they bartered and traded with the Western, um, the arrival of Westerners. And the reason why we know this is there have been metal tools that have found that date to about 1830. Um, in the 1850s, actually, American missionaries from the Marshall Islands head on over to the Caroline Islands, um, and they don't go back until early 1900s. And in that 50-year time span, um, the entire uh, settlement of Micronesia has shifted from indigenous religion and culture into a purely Christian island. In fact, they've even, at that time, converted their indigenous temples um, into Christian churches. Um, this is the book mask and it comes from the Torres Strait. The Torres Strait, even though it's kind of technically considered Australia, um, it's, it's kind of from this area that's between Australia um, and Papua New Guinea. Uh, it's uh, known as Queensland, right? When you look at this, it is uh, a face. A face you can see the clearly see the facial features. The artistic elements that go into the production of this mask were really quite laborious and tedious. In fact, they had to heat up a turtle shell to the point that it became malleable, and then they had to kind of stitch it together with other turtle shells. They then added raffia or grasses. They added shells for embellishment. Um, and this ceremonial and ritualistic piece really was intended to connect humans and animals. It was transformational, if you will, um, kind of giving the wearer supernatural powers. Um, when you think, when you look at this, um, you could kind of liken it to the transformation mask that we looked at from um, Alaska. So this is the book mask. We're going to look at the Mulangan mask or from uh, the display mask. It comes from New Ireland province. And of course, New Ireland is just a small outlying island of Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea, remember, is where um, the Ambam stone came from when we looked at Paleolithic art. Um, same exact kind of region and location. Again, this is used for ritualistic purposes. This mask was meant to um, honor the dead and dismiss the dead into the afterlife. It was also created as an affirmation of identity once the deceased passed on. It was used in the transmission of land rights. When somebody, were, somebody passed away, you would don this mask of the person that had passed it inhibited, inhabited their mana, and mana was another word for their life force, right? So it kind of like the ka in Egypt, right? So the mana was contained in this mask. They can transmit the land rights, um, and they can transmit all kinds of blessing um, upon those around them before they hurry off into the afterlife. Um, and again, uh, meant to kind of inhabit their mana or their life force, if you will. This is just kind of a small um, scene of how this mask might have been used in ritualistic purposes um, with other artifacts that have been found in, from Papua New Guinea. 
Bark cloth. Bark cloth is exactly what it sounds like. It is cloth that is woven from bark. Holy cow, look at this amazing, beautiful mat. To think about the fact that they would have to boil and heat up the bark, pound it thin, add pigments to the point that it becomes so malleable that they can weave it into the material. Um, it was used mainly for exchange and it was also used for tribute. Um, uh, most of these patterns, when you look at it, uh, are quite simple. In fact, the simpler the pattern, the more meaningful the function. Um, and we see this um, as it comes to comes to play uh, in our, not this image, but the next one, when they present Queen Elizabeth with a piece of bark cloth that's quite simple. The piece that you're looking at here, the haapo, this is a tapa, which is also grass cloth. This is almost woven into a lace-like pattern. It was meant to be, and it also has painting on it. It was made to be um, worn um, and used for ceremonial or religious purposes. Queen Elizabeth visits the island of Fiji um, in 1953. It was short, shortly after her coronation, um, she decides uh, along with Prince Philip to take hop on a plane um, and kind of go visit all of the outlying colonies um, or provinces that were owned or settled by England. She comes to Fiji and look at this bark cloth mat. Look how enormous it is. In fact, it takes this whole procession of women carrying it you know, there's like 20 women carrying this huge bark cloth mat that they've made to present to um, Queen Elizabeth. What's most notable um, about this photograph is it tells us so much um, about the Fijian culture um, as it was um, wholly kind of un unscathed at this time. Even though there were European settlers, it was still quite indigenous. Um, this is really kind of this exchange of tribute uh, and ritual. They give to her this very plain and simple mat, um, and it was captured in the photograph for all times. When you look at this, it just looks like a bunch of sticks, right? I mean, the first time I saw this, I was like, really? This is art? But when you're thinking about the fact that their art is revolving around things that they use in on a daily basis. This was indeed such an art form. This is not just a bunch of sticks tied together with string. And in fact, it's a navigation chart. Um, this is found in the Marshall Islands. And the Marshall Islands are con just like the Caroline Islands are kind of considered outliers uh, to oceanic art just because they sit so far out. Um, this navigation chart is a series of sticks tied together with fibers, and it was arranged to show the coral reefs and the atolls. It literally was used for navigation. While we can't see it at all, um, the people that created this were so familiar with oceanic swells, um, with the placement of the atolls, with how they could navigate these atolls um, based on the rising um, and lowering of the tides, they would create these charts. They would act physically bring these charts with them um, in their canoes, and they would also um, memorize these charts. Um, you can imagine people that could make these maps um, were actually prized and quite highly valued. These were prized social items and they would pass them from generation to generation. At first, when Europeans settled the Marshall Islands, they really thought that these people were very um, kind of uh, perhaps not very bright, um, not very innovative. And when they realized that these were um, not just sticks tied together with string, but they were actually mapping the ocean floor um, and the placement of islands, it really changed the opinion of Europeans about the indigenous people of the Marshall Islands. I wanted to end with this piece because when you look at it, you should instantly realize that this is number one, a painting. Uh, oceanic art didn't include painting. They didn't make things that were for aesthetic purposes. Um, so that's unusual. And also when you look at it, it should be very reminiscent of European portraiture. That's because it is European portraiture. This was a chief um, of Nagate Ho people. He was born in the 1780s. He dies in his 90s, about 1871. Um, and this, he was from New Zealand. He was the Maori people. 
Um, he was very, very respected and well known. When you look at his face, first thing I hope you notice is that he is tattooed. It was very traditional for the Maori people to tattoo their, their face, um, and it had ritualistic um, and religious meanings. Um, the British missionaries come to uh, New Zealand um, and they really change his culture and they change his life forever. In fact, his name was not originally Tamati, Tamati Wakanene. It's kind of fun to say, isn't it? Tamati Wakanene. In fact, um, he changes his name in 1939, 1839, excuse me. He was, he converted to Christianity, to the Wesleyan faith, and he decides to change his name to Tamati Waka, because Tamati Waka in his own cultural language translates to Thomas Walker. Thomas Walker was the head of the European Missionary Society. And this chief felt so um, endeared to Thomas Walker for forever changing his spiritual and eternal destiny that he decides to change his name um, to honor him. Interesting thing um, about this painting. First of all, the chief is a great man, highly revered. Um, he was said to have great mana or spiritual presence. Um, the painting um, was, uh, was painted by Godfrey Lindauer, who's a Czech artist. Um, he was uh, a painter that was trained at the Academy of Art in Vienna. And the painting itself is painted in 1890. Remember what I said, this chief dies in 1871. So 19 years posthumously, this painting was created by Lindauer. Um, the um, patron was a guy named Henry Partridge. He was a missionary of great means who lived in New Zealand and he hired Lindauer to document all of the great chiefs um, of, of the Maori people. And this is one of the examples how in the world did Lindauer know what uh, Tamati Wakanene looked like? Well, the London Illustrated News actually sent photographers to this island of New Zealand, um, and they captured more than 12 different Maori leaders. Um, and so Lindauer creates a series of paintings based on these photographs for the London Illustrated News. So that's the end of our images for Oceana. Uh, tomorrow, we're gonna dive into the art of Africa. Thanks guys.